Anyone today have a testimony you'd just like to share today that what God is doing in your life, maybe where God has brought you, or maybe a testimony where God is taking you? Anyone? Just like to share with everyone a word of encouragement. It's wonderful to hear what God's doing in your life because I know that the testimony you will share is going to influence someone now or perhaps when they face a difficulty, they're going to remember the testimony God gave you to share. Always remember that what God does in your life, you should never put it on a shelf or put it like a treasure and bury it in your backyard. God has done something great in your life, and as He has freely given to you, then you should freely give to others. Jesus came not so that He could keep heaven to Himself. That's not the reason Jesus came. He came so that He might give heaven to all of us. Amen? And so we're called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, faithfully giving what God has freely given to us by grace. In Ephesians chapter 6, we read, Finally be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Verse 11, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. I want to stop for a moment and ask you today, what are you standing for in life? You know, as a Christian, you're defined by what you're standing for or who you're standing for. What are you standing for in life? Do you have a stand? You know, some people are like the waves of the sea. They're up and down. They're moving south. They're moving north. They're going in every direction because they're allowing the world to dictate what direction they're going. But as a Christian, a follower of Jesus, God's calling us to take a stand. To be a stand in a world that's shifting and falling apart. We're to stand upon a solid rock. And the rock is God's word so that we might be a light in a dark world. What are you standing for? The scripture says that we should stand wearing the full armor of God. And above all things, we have been looking at, if you look at verse 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take up your shield of faith. The, field, the shield of faith is what God can do in your life when you trust in Him. Faith in God. I want us to define today, we talked about this story from John chapter 11 last week. I want to summarize a little bit what we talked about. And if you want to open in your Bibles, it's found in John chapter 11 in your New Testament. We talked about last time understanding what kind of faith, what kind of faith we have. And I want us to listen carefully to what God's word says. And I want us to be honest today. I want myself, we need to be honest with God. You can't go to the doctor and get well unless first of all, you're what? Honest, right? My mom would go to the doctor and, she, and I'd have to take her because she got to the point she couldn't drive herself. And my mom would always say to me, Paul, keep your mouth shut. And I would say, but mom, why did I take a half day of work off vacation? And now I'm here with you and we're going to see the cardiologist. And you're complaining about all the problems, shortness of breath, pain in your chest. And now we're here to see Dr. Manitza in Hamilton. And now you've told me, Paul, when you go in that room with me, if you can't keep your mouth shut, then you stay out here and wait. I always found it comical. But isn't that true? That's just not my mom. Isn't it true in life that oftentimes we're not honest with the doctor, but more importantly, we're not honest with God? But God is not like the doctor, and He's not like anybody else. God knows your heart. And he knows everything about you, whether you're honest with him or not. God knows you, and he knows what you're going through right now. He knows what you're going to go through tomorrow. 
And so, listen, God is not here to judge and destroy your life. God is here to forgive and save your life and restore it. Do you believe that? Yes? If that's your testimony, raise your hand and say, that is God. That's what God wants to do. God wants to save. God wants to forgive. God is not here today so that He can point out your wrongs and destroy you. God is not that kind of God. He's a God that loves you and He has mercy on those He loves because He wants to save your life. Not harm it. Not destroy it. So for that reason, many people run from God because they're guilty. And they say, I, I, you know what? Maybe one day I'll come to church when I get my life in order, when I get past the addiction, when I get past this problem in my life. The truth is, God knows your problems. All you need to do is be honest with Him, and God will come into your life, and He's going to be the one to get you through those problems. Because you can't do it on your own. You can't do it on your own, can you? Sometimes life is so heavy and all of its burdens, it will crush you. It will destroy you. So what you need to do is come to God in honesty and humility. Seek God's favor because He loves you. And God will lift you up. Humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God. And He will what? He will raise you up. He will lift you up. We just sang that song, Love Lifted Me. That's what it's speaking about. It's talking about how God wants to lift your life up and raise you up. We come to John chapter 11 and here's the story. There are three people that I want to make mention of their names. One is Lazarus, and he has two sisters. Anybody know their names? Very good. Mary and Martha. Who said that? All right, thank you. I didn't see any lips move. It was like a ventriloquist. It was America's Got Talent. No one's mouth moved, but I heard Mary and Martha. So we have a brother and two sisters, and they live in a, a village, a town called Bethany. And word has been sent from Bethany to Jesus that Lazarus is very sick. Now, if you follow the timeline of the story, most likely, that the time the message got to Jesus, he had already done it. Because it was a day's journey to get to Jesus. It says he tarried two days, and then he finally spends a day journeying to Bethany, and he receives word that Lazarus has been dead four days. So that would mean that no sooner than Mary and Martha sent a messenger to find Jesus, most likely their brother Lazarus has already died. He's dead. And now Jesus, four days later, after he has died, he has now journeyed, and he enters into this village called Bethany. Everyone follow me. And there's a large group of people gathered there with Mary and Martha. I want us to read the attitude of their hearts. Okay? Will you follow with me? So let's open up your Bibles to John chapter 11. And let's look at some words. Martha says to Jesus in verse 21, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, look at what the crowd says. Keep in mind, there's a crowd of people. They've gathered at their home. And look at what the crowd says in verse 37. Some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying. Look at what Mary says in verse 32. And when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I want us to question for the moment. What kind of faith do you have today? First of all, I'll say this. There are those who have an influential faith. You say, what do you mean by that? It's very clear that the audience, those who are gathered at the home of Mary and Martha, they influenced Mary and Martha because they said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? This is a very important 
point from God's word. Be very careful in life. Listen carefully. Who you surround yourself with because sometimes the message you're hearing is not the message that God wants you to hear. The message that Mary and Martha was hearing was this. You know, if that Jesus had come, you know, he opened the eyes of blind people. I guess this was too big for him. Or maybe there were other things more important. And Jesus was late getting here. Why didn't he come four days ago? And if he had all this power, why didn't he get here about three days ago? And he could have healed this man. It seems like maybe, Mary and Martha, this Jesus who you say can do all things, maybe you're wrong. Maybe the situation was just too big for Jesus. And maybe your faith was misplaced. There's many person here today. Many people's faith has been misguided because of the influence of other people. You've listened to what other people have said to you. You're listening to what they're saying to you now about something in your life. And listen, if what they're saying to you contradicts your faith in God, you need to get away from that audience. Because you're listening to the wrong people. Faith in God sometimes means that you've got to stand, as we said. Sometimes you need to stand in your faith. And that means wear the armor of God and say, I'm not going to listen to you anymore. What you're saying to me contradicts my faith in God. You need to either change, be quiet, or you need to go back home. Sometimes you need to say to the evil one, the evil one, the devil who's scheming against you, and say, devil, I'm tired of listening to you. You're putting doubt in my mind. You're causing confusion, and you need to get behind me. The Lord rebukes you because what you're saying to me is causing me to doubt my faith in God. It's time for you to leave. And you have power to say so as a Christian. You're a child of God. Remember that. You're a child of God. You've been bought by His blood. His Spirit lives in you. And you have the power to stand even to the evil one and say, The Lord rebukes you. Get behind me, Satan. Because you're not savoring the things of God. You don't have faith in God. Faith in God says, regardless of my situation, regardless of what other people are saying, I'm going to stand and I'm not going to move. Don't allow other people to influence you and to cause you to doubt your faith in God. Now, some people may at home. Some people may at home. Maybe it's a mom, a dad, or someone there, your cousin, an aunt or uncle. And listen, I've heard people even in church, they have caused doubt and confusion because of they're giving their opinion because they don't have any faith in God themselves. They're miserable and they want you to be miserable. Because when you live by faith, you're going to live not miserable, but you're going to be happy, rejoicing in the Lord. Regardless of the situation. Now I want to see the power that their influence had on Mary and Martha. Go back to the beginning of chapter 11. And if you start reading chapter 11, the Bible says that who comes to town? Jesus has come to town. He's come to the village of Bethany. And the Bible says that Martha goes out to meet him. But where does Mary stay? Anyone? Read with me chapter 11 and look at what it says. Anybody reading? Follow with me. Where is Mary at? She stayed at the house. Jesus has come to the village and Mary stays at home. I want you to listen very carefully. Jesus is here today. Jesus is here today. And you need to get out of the house and run to where Jesus is. You understand what I mean by that? Do you understand what God's word is saying that? You see, Jesus has come to the village and Mary, she stayed home listening 
to that audience of people, polluting her mind, sitting in her own sorrows and sadness, doubting God, bitter against God, and she stayed at home. And some of us, listen, there's many Christians today that are staying at home. Their faith has been abandoned. Now there's another kind of faith, you hear me? Their faith is abandoned because something happened in their life, either yesterday or right now, and they blame God and said, God, where were you? I thought you'd be here on that date. You didn't come. You didn't do what I told you to do. And therefore, I'm done. I'm staying home. Their faith has been abandoned. I'm going back home. I'm not serving God anymore. That happened to me at church. People said things to me. God didn't do what I told him I wanted him to do. Therefore, I'm going home. And they quit. Is your faith that kind of faith? You know, I visited with some families lately. They've been through so much. The death of a child. Severe accident of a child. Illnesses, accidents, problems. And those same people have exhibited faith. That's a living faith. Which means, yes, they've been disappointed. Yes, they've been hurt. And yes, they went through difficult trials. But they've got a living faith. And they're standing on a solid rock. Because regardless of the situation, you know, some days the sun is shining, but there'll come a day when it's raining. A lot of people abandon their faith when the rain falls. But you know, the true test of your faith is when it's raining and when the thunder is clashing and when it seems like there is no hope. That's when your faith begins to shine. And you don't listen to other people. You don't listen to even the evil one, the devil. You don't listen to anyone else around you. And you don't even listen. You don't let thoughts come into your mind that contradict your faith in God. That's an important lesson. When something enters your mind and causes you to start doubting your faith in God, immediately pick up His Word and start reading God's Word. Start praying and say, that's enough of that. I remember one doctor, I remember talking with Lynn and years ago, and she said, that's called stinking thinking, something like that. And know what she said? Any bad thought that comes in your mind that you know is going to harm or cause you to be sad or depressed, that's called stinking thinking, and you need to get away from it. When you have a spiritual thought, when something comes in your mind, and or it's someone else, and they're causing you to doubt your faith in God, it's immediately time to say, that's stinking thinking. I'm getting away from that because I'm going to stand on faith in God and nothing is going to move me. Because life is filled with all kinds of surprises. It is. Many times things happen you never expected, nor did you want. Right? Financially, a loss of a job. A loss of a car, whatever it might be. There are situations that happen in your life that you didn't plan for, you never wanted, and suddenly you come to the crossroads in life and you have to make a decision. Am I going to keep my faith in God? Is it real? Is it living? Or am I going to blame God and turn and go the other direction and blame and get bitter and start doubting God? There's a many a Christian today that they took that path, unfortunately. And they're at home today. They're at home. It's time to leave your home of comfort. It's time to leave your home of doubting. It's time to leave that place of listening to others. It's time to start turning to God and run to where Jesus is because Jesus is the only one that can save, help, and deliver. The scripture says here in chapter 11, in verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. And many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. And when Jesus heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Verse 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. 
And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She says in verse 27, yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who was to come into the world. And after this, after she had said this, she went back and called her Mary, sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. <laughs> She's asking for you. Know this is a very important point of this story. Mary and Martha, who doubted God to some degree, when Jesus came to Bethany, he cared about them, and he requested that Mary would come to him. Now, this is important. Mary doubted God. You find what she says in verse 32. Mary says to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. She blamed Jesus that Lazarus died. She put the blame on God. But Jesus called her because Jesus cared for her as he cares for you. Now, I say this to you. Maybe you're watching this video. My heart is burdened for someone I know. You may feel so angry at God because a situation happened. And it's not what you wanted to happen. And you and your life, you can't figure out why it happened. And you blame God and you're angry at God and you've abandoned your faith. And Jesus is calling you to come to him personally because, listen, he does not want you to struggle. He does not want you to be miserable because, listen, God has a purpose, a plan for all things, even though when it doesn't make sense, even though sometimes when it seems like God has abandoned us, God is faithful to us and God will never abandon you. He cares about you. Your name is written in the palm of his hand. He died for you on the cross. He was resurrected on the third day. God loves you and he wants you to trust in him. And that faith will get you through troubles and trials and it will get you through depression and it will get you through sadness and times when you feel like you're angry at God. Put your faith in God above all things and God God in his time will allow you to look back on life and maybe you won't necessarily be happy about what happened but you understand it happened in God's plan that's faith it's trusting that God knows more than you do it's trusting that God loves you more than you love him that's faith and faith is believing no matter what the circumstances, no matter what other people are saying to you, God is not limited by what other people think. But listen, God is limited to do in your life as you believe in him. That's very important. We read this verse last time. The Bible tells us in verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was greatly moved. He says, where have you laid him? And the Bible says he began crying in verse 35. And then we read in verse 38, he continued to be deeply moved. He was greatly troubled and he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone and it was laid across the entrance. And Jesus said, take away the stone. <laughs> take away the stone. Now the people said and Martha said, but Jesus Think about what you're asking us to do. That body has been in there four days and it's beginning to rot. It's going to stink. Are you for sure you know what you're doing? And here you go. A living faith. We don't question. God, you know what you're doing. When God says do, then we do. Because God knows what he's doing. God deserves your faith. And it's time for you and I to quit questioning God. And to say, God, I believe in you, but do you really know what you're doing? A living faith is a daily faith when you put all of your life in God's hands. That's what it means to live by a living faith. Your finances, 
When you get up in the morning, mom and dad, young person, when you get up in the morning, before you do anything else, you know what I like to do? The couch, I get up, I wake up. Usually it's around four o'clock. I stretch a little bit. But then the next thing is, I like to get down on bended knee by the couch. That's a good place to start my day, right? I like to get down on bended knee and say, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, I can't do it without you. And I'm asking you to be my helper. And now my family, they're going to go in different directions. And I'm praying that you're going to watch over Landon and Allie and PJ and their family. I'm praying that you're going to take care of Samantha. Watch over my wife. Take care of us as we all go different directions. Dear God, I'm praying that our lives would be protected by you. As I go to my job, I need you. I can't do it on my own. Help me in every circumstance that I'll honor you. Dear God, help me today. I like to begin that day. You as a young person in school, you ought to begin your day on bending knee. I like to, at the end of my day and throughout the day, I like to end on the same way I started, on bending knee. Why? Because that's what it means to have faith in God. You say, if you don't have faith in God, you won't pray. Why would you pray to begin with, right? That's why so few people pray. You say, oh, I pray. You mean two minutes a day, here or there? That's not prayer. If you really have faith in God, you're going to spend time with God because you believe God can move mountains. And if you believe God can move mountains, then you'll spend time with the one who can move mountains. Mary and Martha, they believed that God existed. They believed one day all those who died would be resurrected. But Jesus wanted them to realize that's not really living faith. Living faith is when you daily submit your life completely to God. And you walk not by sight, but you walk by faith in God. And when Jesus said, move the stone, you know what Jesus wanted to do? He wanted to do something great. He wanted to do something great. And Jesus went on to say in verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? That message is the same message that I preach today because Jesus said it. If you will believe in God and put your faith in God, you will see the glory of God. Do you believe that? Oh, listen, God knows a lot about moving stones. Jesus said, move that stone away from the door of that cave. And not one person, not one person standing there that day agreed with Jesus. Now listen, Jesus was teaching them as he teaches us how to live. He wanted them not to be fixated on the problem or on what they saw as impossible. He wanted them to understand if you'll believe in God, all things are possible because God's not limited to the stones over the cave. No matter what you have in your life, it may feel like there's a stone in your life and it's rolled over your life. And you say, I can't get out. I don't have freedom today. When God enters into your life, He can roll away the stone. And what seems impossible, God can do. God can do. He knows a lot about moving stones. You're in John chapter 11. What happens in John chapter 20? Anyone? Verse 1. Someone stand and read that. Fred, would you read that for us? John chapter 20, verse 1. You see, Jesus knew what was going to happen in his life. Shortly after the story of Lazarus being resurrected, Jesus himself was very soon going to be killed, and he would be put into a cave. And a stone would be rolled over that cave. But we read in John chapter 20, verse 1. What do we read, Fred? And again, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb with the stone and then removed from the entrance. Amen. The stone was gone. God moved the stone as he promised because, listen, what we could not do, God did when he raised Jesus. 
he rolled the stone away. Do you believe that? You can be saved when you trust in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross and God raised him from the dead. Do you believe that message? Do you really believe that? Because God will enter into your life and God will do the impossible. He'll give you a purpose and he'll give you a plan. That's what God wants to do. And you can trust and put your faith in God. Amen? Because God's plan, His promises to you, they will never be broken. They'll never lead you in the wrong way. He cares about you. And I want to ask you something here today. I'm going to ask you, if you will, maybe you're watching a video, but I want you to stop for a moment. And I want everyone in here, and I want you to be very honest. Remember that's how we started the service today? We're going to be honest. I'm going to have every head is bowed and eyes closed. No one's looking around. And I want to ask you something. I want you to be honest. No one's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I want to ask you a question. Is your faith real in Jesus? Is it? I'm not asking you, do you believe in God? Even the devil believes in God. That's not what it means to be a Christian. To be a Christian means that you believe that he died for your sins and that he was resurrected from the dead. And that he promises to come into your life if you'll repent. That means to have a change of mind, a change of heart. And ask God for forgiveness and ask God for a new direction. To follow Jesus with all your life. That's what it means to be a Christian. To means to put your faith, trust in him and say, Lord, you loved me and you gave your very own son for me. Therefore, I trust you. I want to live for you. Come into my heart. Save me. Take me from a dangerous place and put me in a safe place. Have you ever done that? Would you like to do that today? Anyone? No one's looking around. Every head is bowed. Eyes closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. You say, I would like to do that today. Would you just simply raise your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray with you right where you are. Anyone? Just lift your hand where you are and say, I'd like to do that today. I'd like to put my faith in Jesus Christ. My heart is burdened. I see your hand. You may put it down. Anyone else? I see your hand. Anyone else today? Just raise your I see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Hands have been lifted here today. And I hope those hands means you're being honest with God. That's a brave thing to do, isn't it? Be honest with God. Because, listen, you don't get better until you're honest. Now you say, what do I need to do? I want you to listen carefully. If you raised your hand, I want you to listen carefully. The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you understand that? We've all sinned. The Bible tells us, secondly, that God in His love sent His one and only Son, Jesus, and He came to earth. And on the cross, He died for your sins. Because sins must be paid for. Your sins, my sins, the world's sins, they must be paid for either by you or by Jesus Christ. Thirdly, is to confess and say, Jesus, I confess to you, I've sinned against you. I've done things that are wrong, either in my thoughts or by my deeds, by my words. I've done things that are wrong. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. That means you and me and everyone else. No, no, not one. Nobody. And I confess that I've sinned against you and I want you to come into my life. I believe your word. Your word says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's God's word. Do you believe it? And if you believe it, I want you to receive it today by faith, by trusting God and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart today. I want to live for him. I want to follow him with my life. I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to take my life and use it any way you want to. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer today, there's going to be some music playing. I'm going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to go come back there and try to take your hand. You know why? Because in every situation when Jesus was on earth, he would say, come follow me publicly. And Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before the angels of God. I will confess your name before my Father in heaven. 
Every time Jesus would ask people to come and follow him, they did it publicly. They took a stand. Does that make sense? They took a stand. That's what an invitation is. Is to say publicly, I'm taking a stand for Jesus today. As he died for me publicly on the cross, I'm publicly standing and saying, I want to follow him. So while the music's playing, you don't have to stand up. I'm going to ask you today to be honest with yourself, with God. And as the music's playing, I'll be standing here and I'd like to pray with you today. You know, the good news is the Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The invitation is being given now. The music's playing. If in your heart, you follow Jesus by praying, when we're praying together, I'm going to be standing here. I just want to pray with you. I'm not going to try to embarrass you. I just want to say to you that you have followed Jesus in your heart and life. Anyone today? Come. You'll be glad you did. Oh, you'll be glad you did. Get a purpose in your life. A plan. Amen. Bailey comes. I'm going to ask Bailey if she will just to sit right here next to Ryan for a moment. Anyone else today? It's a courageous thing to do, young lady. Bailey comes. Anyone else today? Amen. Emma? What a courageous thing, young lady. I'm so proud of you two young ladies. Anyone else today? Just to come next to these. We're going to pray together in a moment. Thank you, young ladies. Anyone else will just come today and say, I come. I want to follow Jesus with my life. Anyone? Why don't you come? I tell you, we're going to have a great day in the Lord today. Anyone? We'll listen to one more stanza of this song. Anyone else today? God speak in your heart. Why don't you come? Young ladies, I tell you a story. You gotta listen to my stories. A young girl, you're 13. She was 13. One day she took a stand in Jesus. She called me on the phone and she said, Paul, I need to tell you what I did at church today. I said, John East, what happened? She said, Today. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I hung up the phone. I started to cry because I was not a believer. My young cousin named John East led me to know Jesus because of her stand. She was 13, January 1974 or so, nine or something. I forget what year, 1979. She was going down the steps of her junior high school. 13 years old. Someone pushed her from behind. She fell down the steps and hit her head at the floor. No one knew it, but she had cracked a, a, a plate in her brain, in her skull. Three days later, she was dead. For all eternity, that young girl is going to spend with God all because she gave her life to Jesus. And I will someday spend eternity with God. All because one day, a little 13-year-old girl called her cousin and said, Paul, let me tell you what I did in church today. You see, what you do today is greatly important for your own life and for others. Do you understand? Me? I'm proud of you. Anyone else today? I'm going to ask them, while the music's playing, I'm going to ask these girls a few questions. Young ladies.